Hi, Critical Thinkers. Welcome to the 20th edition of Critical Mass TV. A milestone that means a lot to me personally, and one that I hope means something to someone somewhere. So before we begin this evening, I just want to say that um, Brad, who is me, has exemplified his own version of seasonal stupidity disorder and unfortunately dragged some wonderful people into his personal polar vortex of perplexity. <laughs> to those people, I love, I humbly apologize um, so much for my own version of magical thinking. So enough of, enough of the apology, but I, I really mean that sincerely. <clears throat> so critical mass is the fewest people required to sustain beautiful, meaningful change in the world. And knowing that, let's get going with some mixed mental arts for intellectual self-defense. This is VCAM, Vermont Community Access Media. It's a beautiful weekend, or it has been a beautiful weekend, except for the rain earlier. Actually, rain is good. And uh, Burlington, Vermont is an incredible place to be. Um, Sunday, April 13th, 2014 brings us a very interesting show. Tonight's guests have traveled far to appear with me this evening. They have the courage of their convictions and can well articulate their important perspectives. We will be talking industrial wind, um, short-sighted uh, human entitlement, and false options and solutions. And I hope offering insight and ideas helpful to you uh, people that are watching, who would be our viewers. So uh, to finish out the show tonight, um, Matthew Ennis is going to come back and join us and tell us about the most recent events uh, in the continuing effort to make mandatory labeling of GMO, or Genetically Modified Organism Foods, law in the state of Vermont. So uh, please join me in welcoming Susanna Jones, David Rogers, and Ann Morse. Um, all three were arrested on Lowell Mountain in December of 2011 in a powerful posture of resistance. So hi, how you doing? Good. Good. Thank Thanks you. for having us. You bet. Thank you for coming all that way to, to mm -hmm. up here. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so before we get rolling, if Susanna will allow me, <clears throat> I'd like to read an op-ed piece that she wrote um, that brilliantly, in my opinion, provides context for tonight's discussion and also links big wind to the underlying crux of big greed. So. She has allowed me to read that, so I'm going to do that. Okay. Um, this is Susanna's op-ed piece uh, for, published in Vermont Digger, February 8, um, 2013, and it was entitled, What Happened to Bill McKibben? In his 2008 book, Deep, Deep Economy, Bill concludes that economic growth is the source of the ecological crises we face today. He explains that when the economy grows larger than necessary to meet our basic needs, when it grows for the sake of growth, automatically striving for more, its social and environmental costs greatly outweigh any benefits it may provide. Unfortunately, McKibben seems to have forgotten what he so passionately argued just five years ago. Today, he is an advocate of industrial wind turbines on our ridge lines. He wants to industrialize our last wild spaces to feed the very economy he fingered as the source of our environmental problems. His key assumption is that industrial wind power displaces the use of coal and oil and therefore helps limit climate change. But since 2000, wind facilities with a total capacity equivalent to 350 coal-fired plants have been installed worldwide. And today, there are more, not fewer, coal-fired power plants operating. At best, industrial wind simply adds more energy to the global supply. And what for? More. More energy than the grid can carry, more idiotic water parks, 
more snow making more electronic gadgets more money for corporations why should we spend millions of dollars to destroy wildlife habitat kill bats and eagles pollute our headwaters fill valuable wetlands polarize our communities make people sick mine rare earth metals just to ensure that we can consume as much or more next year than we did this year the costs of industrial wind far outweigh the benefits unless you are a wind developer federal production tax credits and other subsidies have fostered a gold rush mentality among wind developers who have been abetted by political and environmental leaders who want to appear green without challenging the underlying causes of our crises. Meanwhile, average Vermonters find themselves without any ability to protect their communities or the ecosystem of which they are a part. The goal of an industrial wind moratorium is to stop the gold rush so we can have an honest discussion on these issues. Why does this frighten proponents of big wind? Because once carefully examined, industrial wind will be exposed for the scam that it is. McKibben's current attitude towards the environment has been adopted by politicians, corporations, and big environmental organizations. Environmentalism has been successfully mainstreamed at the cost of its soul. This co-opted version isn't about protecting the land base from the ever-expanding empire of humans. It's about sustaining the comfort levels we feel entitled to without exhausting the resources required. It is entirely human-centered and hollow, and it serves corporate capitalism well. In Deep Economy, McKibben points out that the additional stuff provided by an ever-growing economy doesn't leave people happier. Instead, the source of authentic happiness is a healthy connection to nature and community. As Vermonters have already discovered, industrial wind destroys both. What industrial wind represents should be obvious to everyone. And this is great. This is business as usual, disguised as concern for the earth. Far from genuine environmentalism, it is the same profit and growth driven destruction that is at the root of every ecological crisis we face. And I'm going to ask for her permission to add my personal opinion. I would add that it's every ecological, social, political, and economic crisis that we face. Um, everything is truly related and inseparable. And I added that last bit, and I, I, I apologize. <laughs> oh, it's okay. So, I, I mean, I really, really, I, I think you got, uh, you, you summed up so many points that, that are so critical in talking about wind power, because, I mean, the wind blows. What, you know, at an elemental level, when we're looking at each other, what's wrong with the wind blowing turbines around you know and, and on with the discussion so you know what um t tell me tell me again what what are what are the pratt falls of um of well basically blasting the tops of our ridge lines off and and putting up wind turbines i i think the first of all if when you're looking at something that's industrial scale that's feeding corporations it's all wrong and I mean, when you do talk about, like my father loves to talk about growing up on a farm where they had a little wooden windmill that pumped the water up from the well and, and they could fix it themselves. Um, that, that was very real scale. Mm -hmm. um, what we have with these industrial projects is just, like I said, business as usual. Right. Dressed up like something else. Mm-hmm. We can't pretend we're not in a paradigm of being absolutely dominated by corporations, finance, and all the complexes that make up, whether it's corporate media, military, industrial, you know, we're, we're in that paradigm. So um, I, I'm getting you on that, that, that big wind is, is um, it will just simply in some fashion replace an energy source and it all comes out in the wash it really doesn't make any difference and we never are going to touch the underlying root causes of why we're all kind of screwed in the first place right. um, I think there's a lot of irony too in like taking a stance as someone who cares about the earth and as an environmentalist to basing a solution on the premise of first blowing up a mountain 
and destroying one of the few remaining more or less intract intact ecosystems that we have and that to me that's why i got involved in opposing the low wind project to start with was just that just that sort of gut level feeling of that just doesn't seem right i mean i i am a big fan of the pr the principle of do no harm and that's uh, it just seemed fundamentally in opposition to that like if we want solutions we need to start by doing things that are holistic and that are integrated and that are small scale and community managed and for the benefit of people and the planet, not for the benefit of some rich corporation. Yeah. So I think that's, um, there's just a lot of irony in that. Yeah, yeah tragedy. I think, I think it, it, it reinforcing the same thing, you know, you don't save the environment by destroying it, you know, and that's unfortunately what happened in the Lowell Range. It's not a question of wind or being against wind. I think wind in the right place on a small scale, individual turbines, and also, you know, in the places that the federal government long ago studied to where there is wind, in the Midwest, in the Southwest, uh, on the coasts and, and the ocean, the, you know, there are other, other problems, but those do not require the destruction of the environment to make the platform. Here, in this case, you have, in the Lowell case, is, is a terrible example. They spaced the turbines, uh, you know, equally apart because of turbulence, but as a result, they were not using the natural places for platforms, so they had to create places. So they had to blow up a lot of rubble mm -hmm. to make these platforms. And so that was the real crime there of, of really doing permanent damage to the mountain. It is not going to repair itself in time. That is permanent, massive damage to the top. And anyone who goes up there will come to that conclusion. And a lot of people's minds have been changed, including politicians including the head of the Vermont Electric Co-op, by going up there and seeing what happened there, not right. seeing photographs that don't right. really show it, really seeing. And so it's, it, you gotta think complexly about this issue, not simplistically. Mm -hmm. It's good in the right place, it's not good in the tops of mountains. Or it does work in the right it place. Doesn't, it it yeah, has yeah. less it's impact. It's much more destructive mm -hmm. right. on the tops of mountains. I but know. there are other places where it is a very good solution. What's kind of, you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking about like walking on the top of Camel's Hump. Mm -hmm. You will literally get accosted and tackled by a <laughs> yeah, state employee if, if you wander down. off <laughs> yeah. the, the, uh, the, the trail to yeah, protect the sensitive the tundra. Yeah. But yeah. you can, if, if some freaking Canadian yeah. corporation yeah. wants to ram these things in here, like a lot of other infrastructure, eminent domain type of type of um, <clears throat> you know machinations they can literally blow the whole top of the damn place off. I mean where does that fit in the you know well the part of the tragedy is that this is kind of a setup act 248 was what made the public service board had to address not act 250 so 40 years of act 250 were totally ignored in this right. destruction of the mountains the whole purpose of act 250 under Dean Davis was to protect the mountains against adverse right. development on the top. Anything up to above, over 2,500 yeah, above feet. A certain height. Mm -hmm. This was uh, just thrown completely out. But, yeah. but it was set, a set up because it allowed under 248 the utilities to go before the public service board rather than to the environmental board. It was also fast-tracked yeah. by yeah. Shumlin yeah. when yeah. he got yeah. in office. Yeah. And as everybody yeah. should be aware of by now, um, a lot of proposed energy projects, pipelines and things, have all been given a kind of green light by this administration. So, green light. Yeah, and exactly. They had, they had <laughs> Forty-eight million dollars of federal subsidy that they had to, you know, they had to complete it by the end of December, 2012, and that was the thing that everybody said, you know, including the court, said, well, forget about the boundary dispute, forget about, you know, the environmental issues, you know, the. Natu the Agency of Natural Resources, we're here to facilitate this project. They abandoned their basic mission of protecting the environment of Vermont, and they just went right through. Right, uh, as soon as you have a multinational corporation of size mm -hmm. and corporatist politicians working together, um, you know, you, everybody knows, it's what's the quote from, from H.G. Wells, and, or Orson Wells, I mean an animal farm, we're all created equal, but some of us are just more George equal than George others. <laughs> or George Orwell. Sure, sure. yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, and and the, the corporations and their corporatist politicians—they actually there is some level of functioning democracy at that level. 
you know they for for those institutions not us but they can they can make stuff happen i'd like to go back to why it's important to protect mountains because i think that's a really important piece like we had that legislation to protect mountains and now we've kind of overrun that and we're developing the mountains and i think we just need to keep in mind there's many levels on which mountains and their intact forested ecosystems are really valuable to us in terms of absorbing spoken racist ideologies unabated in exchange for the sacrificing of our children to appease the corporate gods i mean she does definitely not pull any punches i I thought i was was right out there but i mean you know that i guess you know she, she really is coalescing um some of the way i feel about you know after i had met Susanna and i heard and i heard and your viewpoints and read some of what you um you know showed me led me to to read that um i really i honestly have to admit that a few years ago i i just had not made that intellectual leap um with big wind and you know and how it fits into the bigger picture i also think we're 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 asking the wrong question when we're we're thinking about uh when we're driven really by maintaining industrial capitalism because it's pretty comfortable, mm-hmm. um, we ask the question, how can we keep this system um, but green it up a little bit so we don't feel so bad? But the real questions we should be asking, I think, is how do we live in healthy reciprocity with the land base? It will give you a very different answer, and I think the only way towards something that doesn't mean self-annihilation. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We need to, we definitely need to to be aware that as a as a society and individually that we are going to have to make some lifestyle changes. And, and mm-hmm. in my in in my mind, I I can always picture. Um, it doesn't. We you know we definitely don't need to regress. It, it can still be a bit of moving forward, mm-hmm. but we cannot do. If you put industrial. Um, in front of, of the uh, the concept that we're talking about maintaining either transforming or reforming then we're, we're probably you're already headed towards that that cliff mm. you you know um, so we we certainly can have a society that where where we can that would be more primarily land-based and where where everyone in the entire planet can have a, a, a decent and sustainable style like you know uh, standard of living and I, I, you know, it's it's and it has been illustrated quite uh, well by others that that all of that is possible. We have without the industrial agriculture and without um, you know the the massive amounts of transporting ourselves that we do and all that, we can still be fundamentally happy, contented, and industrious and productive, which I think drives all of us. I mean, all of us here are probably quite active quite industrious and, and we always feel like we need to be producing but it, it doesn't need to be clouds of gases it doesn't mm-hmm. need to be leading to mm-hmm. you know just spoiling the oceans and and our entire land base and um, mountain t- removing mountaintops for coal mm-hmm. and just you know it just goes on and on mm-hmm. so one of the things I want to address is that we've been painted by the proponents of industrial wind, we've been painted as climate change deniers, and yeah. we're not at all. We're just um, not believers in industrial scale solutions, so pseudo solutions. Mm-hmm. And like we said before, that is that is hard. It's really, it is hard for somebody who's one, a member of one of these mainstream environmental organizations that really I consider would to be my natural ally and really mm-hmm. does genuinely concern about us having a future together. Mm-hmm. And when they hear that somebody is anti-industrial wind, it, it can be shocking mm-hmm. and it, you really have to deconstruct and then reconstruct your, you know, some of your basic beliefs. And I think there's an important reason why it's shocking to people and that is that there's been a really effective media campaign around how green these solutions are and I think that there's been a deliberate portrayal of things like industrial wind um, by corporations who stand to profit from them as green and sustainable solutions and that's been very effective so I think that your average person who cares about the earth and wants to solve the problems is easily sucked into that and then it becomes also it becomes some, something hopeful and something positive and we all want to believe that there's a solution in sight and I think it's really challenging, but it's super important to look at 
what are the root causes of the problems and then what are some real solutions instead of the smoke and mirrors solutions. I've really come to see industrial wind as a set of smoke and mirrors that doesn't achieve any significant CO2 reduction and that diverts people's energy away from needing to conserve and think of alternative ways of living like you were just talking about. Yeah. And also it, it um, diverts us into fighting with each other mm -hmm. um, over these issues. And I think one of the most destructive things that's happened in the environmental movement in Vermont in the last 10 years is may well be the this whole industrial wind issue because it's gotten yeah. us um, really fighting against each other polarized. and very polarized. Oh, the natural, ga very the natural gas issue well, is, is beginning to heat up like mm -hmm. that, you know, to use a bad yeah. pun. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It really is because people say, you know, it's it's inexpensive. It's natural gas. It's just laying down there in the ground, and you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's a lot cleaner and greener, and it doesn't. But you know, not understanding the fundamental basic science that it absolutely, it probably net adds more very very aggressive greenhouse gases, short term, long term, longer term, than than even burning coal. You know, so those again are those false solutions. Right, and so what I want to say to all of our allies who are fighting against the tar sands pipeline and who are fighting against fracked gas pipelines um, and who are fighting against mountaintop coal mining, that we are fighting against industrial scale wind in Vermont for the same reasons yeah. that they're fighting those projects. And I, I ally myself and I work actively with people who are fighting against the pipelines in Vermont. Um, and I think that's a really important alliance. And my my point is that um, we, we should be allies and we need everyone to understand that industrial wind is a symptom of the same problem that's causing the pipeline it's also, craziness. It's also important to note that in Vermont we have a very unique situation where in 2005 our legislature wrote a, what they call the speed laws in Vermont around energy issues and in that um, makes it okay for um, corporations that have these green projects to sell, you, you get like a certification called a renewable energy credit. So you can take that credit, that little piece of paper, and sell it to a place producing really dirty energy. And you can, um, in Vermont, still call yourself a green project but you're actually making it okay for these other dirty energy um, companies to be producing that. So, and that it's double accounting. It's actually illegal according to the FTC. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's it. All this greenness is actually um, being used to fake us out. Right. That's <laughs> just commodifying the mm -hmm. issue and then mm -hmm. f developing another market. Because if there's one thing neoliberals are very good at. It's commodifying and turning everything into a market. I mean, even even we are seen as nothing but simple little human capital to be traded and you know messed with and. Well, and those little pieces of paper, those wrecks they're called, mm -hmm. are a lot. You, they're much more profitable than the actual energy that's being produced by these things. So right. It's it's all set up. And 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 one of the authors of that legislation now has a very fancy job with Green Mountain Power. Mm -hmm. So, of course, this is how these things all work. The it's no surprise. The revolving Yeah, uh-huh. Um, Arthur just stepped in, and Arthur is our technical director, and he had a point, too, and David, David uh, touched with it earlier. So, say the miracle of miracles, Wall Street tumbled into the sea, everybody had enlightenment. The second enlightenment I always talk about, because the first one obviously didn't take. <laughs> um, and, and so a miracle happened around the world. We, we became enlightened. Is there a place for industrial wind in, in that future society where we're not committing all industrial warfare for profit on each other, where we're not you know, raping and destroying our ecosystem and abusing people, and, which is the current paradigm? Do you think you know, offshore, is, is there a way, even with a different designed turbine that doesn't smack you know, eagles out of the sky, I mean, is the wind, does the wind have a place in an energy future in any context? What do you think? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I, though I think, you know, one of the issues is our centralization of the whole grid. And we really are very vulnerable. Uh, you just see what happens when electricity goes off in our world today. You know, nothing works. 
you can't get cash, you can't use the ATM, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we're very vulnerable. We would be much better if we had smaller grids mm -hmm. and we had you know, much more local and we had more community-based powers like with solar panels for towns, for individual towns that could be uh, independent of the larger grid. And you know, we, we, the, the place for, for wind is where it doesn't harm human beings, it doesn't damage the landscape. And there are good places for you know there there are a lot, there are always issues there are issues of noise if you live too close to it there, that's a, that's a serious problem within a mile mm -hmm. but it depends on the size of the turbine but you know there there are large uh, wind developments in the Midwest and the Southwest where there is the most wind Vermont is actually not very good for wind and that was studied long before yeah I know it, it's, I remember uh, or forty eight yeah so yeah. so. You know, and then there's the issue by the ocean. There are problems there, but you get 40 percent. You know, the you know of, of the time that you're actually generating electricity with the ones by the ocean because of the winds. Uh, the Lowell Range project now is running like 23 percent of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was going to be 34 percent mm -hmm. of the time or something like that. I mean, there's just, there, it actually isn't the wind. Right. Uh, and uh, so. You know, there is a. I think the small, smaller scale uh, turbines for individual houses and mm -hmm. farms. I think that I never. I the always whisper of five those. thousands and all those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just. Again, you have to think complexly about the problem and not fall for the simple solution. And decentralization. I have had many guests that have mm -hmm. talked yeah, in an agricultural yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. It's what Matthew yeah. will talk about, you know, in, in the context of Monsanto and, mm -hmm. or, and yeah. the in, yeah. industrial yeah. agriculture complex. You know, decentralization seems to be a, a very common recurring theme. Yeah, yeah. Neoliberal corporate capitalism wants to aggregate, merge, and condense mm -hmm. and construct giant monopoly yeah, megapolies. Monopolies. We're, we're almost back to, to maximize the their gain of the last right. century, right. where monopolies dominate the whole economy. And you know, every time you see another merger or a thing, you just roll your eyes. Oh, I uh, cringe worse than yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. that's I mean, this yeah. is this is. Yeah, I think scale is a really important question, and also who controls it is a really mm -hmm. important okay, question there that you comes go. into play when you're talking about the complexity. Because I think, I mean, I've come to a point where I just look for with great skepticism on any solution that's being proposed by a large corporation that has uh, a lot of stake in profiting, but very little stake in quality of life and actual mm -hmm. outcomes and solutions. And I think that the bottom line is we. Any any project needs to be evaluated on the basis of its actual merits and, and the degree to which it actually provides a needed, low cost, environmentally worthwhile mm -hmm. um, solution. Which also brings us, I think, to part of the confusion being that some quote unquote environmental organizations really lobby aggressively for industrial wind, and here in Vermont, both VPIRG and VNRC have have lobbied very aggressively in favor of wind. Um, they have, you know, they get funding from uh, uh, sources that have wind people on the boards. They have wind people, funders, and proponent, uh, you know, developers on their boards. Um, and I think actually Chris Hedges said this best um, in his book, Death of the Liberal Class. He talks about how, um, over the last century, uh, liberals or the the left has basically failed to um, defend the values it espouses, mm -hmm. and this fundamental disconnect between belief and action has been corrupting and disastrous, and it has resulted in this kind of thing, where um, basically he says the watchdogs, the historic watchdogs against the the abuses of the capitalism and the elite, have betrayed um, that role in order to get a comfortable seat at the table and inclusion in the club. And so, unfortunately, it's created a power vacuum in which totalitarian elements have historically filled. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it can, it's kind of scary, actually, but this is our history around the world. This kind yes. of thing has happened. Um, he thinks that the, the fate of the liberal class has been really um, tragic, particularly tragic, because it they have willingly silenced the radicals and iconoclasts that gave them moral guidance. Right. And and in so doing, you know, they were supporting foolishly supporting corporations and institutions that have ultimately annihilated them. 
um, because they were refusing to question unfettered capitalism and globalization and educational institutions because they were seduced by careerism, prestige, and comforts. Right, and so wh exactly what we're seeing, they've, they've severed their, their connection to uh, the, like the, the good thinking that was happening and have, have basically sold us all out. They, yes. they, they've betrayed us all, and that's what we're seeing with these environmental organizations. And I know it can be very confusing to people, but... But, and the state government. I, feel, I, I was naively looking at Vermont as you know, s different than the rest of the country, but uh, on this particular issue, I feel terribly betrayed by the governor, by our representatives in Congress, and by the Agency of Natural Resources mm -hmm. and the Public Service Board. They are not protecting us. At, at the core, you know, protecting that's us. that's where we're in like the Citizens United decision and the yeah. most recent well, uh, decisions yeah. by the Supreme Court about unlimited corporate money can be poured into these um, campaign cycles. Mm. The, mm. What, what you end up with is an a, entire political class of strictly corporatists. Yeah. They yeah. serve corporate interests. That is their entire constituency. They take all of their money and, and get all of their ideas from corporations and co other mm -hmm. corporatists. Mm -hmm. And the giant unliving corporation, which will never go away, you know, unless we stop it, um, gets total hegemony over the world and, and our, even in Vermont. I mean, it's, it, yeah, it is a function of absolute Vermont. corporate domination. Which is why I think it's really important to talk about resistance, yeah. Yeah. citizens' <laughs> resistance. So yeah. I, I want to make sure we share with your listeners some of the tools that we used in opposing the Lowell Wind Project. But I'm wondering if you want to show those video clips yeah. before hey, Jim, we do that. Yeah, hey Jim, can we show those videos, sir? meadows up there and beautiful views in his later years my husband he takes children up there and and the grandchildren I sit out there and hear the birds and the frogs it was just beautiful it was so beautiful I always felt that I was blessed. It's just sad. It really is to see, you know, the, the destruction that's going on up there. This project is destroying the mountain. It's just, it's just destroying it. Born and raised up here on the firemen. Yeah. It looks like a, it's a totally different place now. The top of the mountain will never look the same. Yeah. It's gone. Gone. I mean, it's level. been farming it for for 36 30, years, six years in uh, October and it was, our grand, years. it was our grandfather's farm we're third generation he bought it back in the early 20s yeah. until now everything's been fine been beautiful my brother and I are up at the age where we want to get done this is our retirement right here and uh, we've had people already back out because they do not want to live by the wind towers and uh, this is all we have this is it and had it appraised and it's down to uh, about half of what the, the original, original appraisal, appraisal was right now it's already and, and we still, were still <laughs> no one's buying it 
and right. still no one. Is there anybody out there that'd like to live under the turbines? Come <laughs> forward. <laughs>I used to have faith in the judicial system with, you know, all the truth will come out and all this sort of stuff, but apparently I was naive because it seems as though most of, most of the decisions regarding these projects, it's not about the truth. This whole Act 248 process is, is a joke. I mean, people are used to the Act 250 process and the, the amount of input that individuals have in that process. This process basically eliminates all of that. People still think that they're, they're going to have a say in this today. They, they have no idea. They have the public forums where they, they ask for input from the public on these projects ahead of time, and they're, they're going on all the time, even today. But that input is, is useless. You know, they completely disregard that. It's, 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 a, it's slanted in the favor of the developer. It, it's like it's, it's a pretend thing. Like it makes you feel like, oh, okay, there is something for us, but it, it doesn't work. It's almost like that they're yeah. they're going through the motions to make us as Vermonters feel like they're working for us. Yeah. But it's almost like that they have uh, their their mind made up before know. we were even yeah. going to speak with they them. They already know what their mind is, yeah. I thought you'd go to something like that and you'd be given a fair shake. And it was just a waste of our time. I mean, it's a show. They've got this deadline that they feel that they, well, that they have to meet for the federal, ta you know, federal tax credit and they're going to hit that date yep. come hell or high water, you yep. know, just to get out of their way. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to do what they're going to do. Vermont's a very small state, so the, the locations in order to put a project like this are very, very limited. And I don't think Vermont is a place for wind turbines, at least of the industrial scale. Just because there's a mountaintop that's a great place to put a wind turbine, that doesn't mean that you should put it there. And looking ahead, you know, we're worried about the noise. And there's like, it's a pretty bleak outlook for us if there is a noise issue. Uh, you know, what are we going to do about it? Obviously, we haven't had any luck with anything else, so it's very disheartening. I just am, am sad because my two boys aren't going to know what George Mountain was like, except by pictures. This family's been around, like Dad said, for you know, <coughs> three plus generations working this land and building this farm, and we're not listened to. We're a Vermont family, and we just want, uh, we want the best for Vermont, yep. you know?
to our little technical glitch earlier. We're running a little bit short on time. Um, this is a quote by Ann Peterman. Then why are we trying to reform this system? Why are we not transforming it? If you focus solely on eliminating fossil fuels without changing the underlying system, then very bad things will take their place because it, because it is the system itself that is unsustainable. It is a system designed to transform natural capital and human labor into gargantuan profits for an elite few, the so-called 1%. Whether it's driven by fossil fuels or biofuels or massive solar and wind installations, the system will continue to devour ecosystems, displace communities, indigenous peoples and farmers from their lands, crush labor unions and generally make life a living hell for the vast majority of people. That is what it does. So um, would you guys willing to be resistant again and get arrested again for similar, for sim you know, in resistance to similar issues? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. I, it was one of the best things I ever did because I was so angry at this project and the feeling of having no power. And this gave me a feeling that I really could do things. And though we didn't stop the project we brought the issues to a statewide level with our trial uh, and we appealed all the way to the Supreme Court and we got a very good dissenting opinion from Justice Dooley. And I think we started to make people think about the issues and not just knee-jerk the guilt-free green uh, reaction. And for that reason, several uh, projects have been yeah, dropped. Yeah. That's what I was other gonna towns, ask you. Yeah. Are yeah. there other projects in the works right now is is there more stuff um you know in, in the in the you know pipeline i use that term loosely but i think well, the only one left really is uh well it was grafton and wyndham and it's yeah. grafton they've dropped the grafton side of the mountain and they're working on wyndham but okay but the grandpa's knob project was dropped uh newark uh, ferdinand mountain. yeah wow. those were all I mean, At least for now, I think right. it's important not to get complacent, but I think yeah. it's also really important to recognize um, the many layers that you have to be active on in order to have an impact like the one we had. And I think that um, it's really important to participate in all the public processes that they talk about with that little film clip. And also important to just use any foothold you can to obstruct progress. And that's what we did, is occupied the disputed property that the Nelsons own. Um, and we were able to delay, delay blasting for periods of time and also to block the, the crane path there. Um, and I th so I think it's really important for people to take direct action and to look at weak spots in the arguments and to do um, public education. We hosted um, well over 200 people up on the mountain over the course of a year or so to look yeah. at the site um, in person and that, that had a really big impact on a number of people. Um, so sustaining the moral outrage, sustaining yeah. the activism, sustaining the resistance yeah. is what it really is the, the best tactic we have to, mm -hmm. s to st solve these issues or at least make an impact so we can mm -hmm. have the conversations that you were talking about. We have to shift gears now. I really, I, I hope desperately we can have you back at some point. So we, this, this issue is, is critically important as far as, the, uh, you know, because we're dealing with way more than just big wind here, obviously. So I would like to introduce again Matthew Ennis. Well, like I said, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, we have been uh, had you know sustaining coverage on the issue of GMO labeling in the state, mandatory labeling of, of GMO foods, and um, there have there have been you know some some events that have happened recently. Matthew, tell us um, you know fill us in with what you with, with what you know. So um, you know the bill it's for labeling uh, processed food. And it passed the Vermont House last session, last April. Mm -hmm. And now it's gone to Vermont Senate. And it's been through th three committees in the Vermont Senate. It passed out of the Agriculture Committee four to one. It passed out of the Judiciary Committee five to zero. And then this past week it passed out of Appropriations seven to zero. Wow, I mean, that's, that surprises me. Yeah, I mean, I think that we've had a lot of pressure. I mean, a lot of us have been working on this issue for 15 years, and there's a lot of new people working on the issue, and we just have a lot of momentum right now, and the lawmakers are listening, seem to be listening to us. I know. And, you know, we don't, we want to make sure we get this bill through and get it signed, 
So um, this week is, there's a vote in the full Senate, and we're asking people to call their senators, their state senators. Um, you can call them at the State House, at the Sergeant at Arms, and the number there is 800-322-5616. And you can call there between 8.30 and 4.30 tomorrow, or between 8.30 and 10 on Tuesday morning, because apparently they're going to be talking about it later Tuesday morning. So we want to get the calls in right. in the next couple of days, the next day and a half. And for those in Chittenden County, it's um, Tim Ash, Philip Baruth, Jenny Lyons, uh, Michael Sorotkin, Diane Snelling, and David Zuckerman. Those are our six state senators. Call them. Call yeah. them out, call them off, and keep but them calling But if people are hearing this outside of Chittenden County, you can go to vermont.gov and go to the legislative website off of there and you can figure out who your state senators are because they all need calls. Mm -hmm. Now after, if this passes, which we expect it will, then it has to go to conference committee. It has to be resolved between the House and the mm -hmm. Senate bills. There are some variations on the bill. So there could be a vote back in the House again. So it could be the people will need to follow up and call their House members. And to find out, to follow the issue, people can um, go to the website <clears throat> Uh, vtrighttoknow.org and that's a website where you can follow the issue and see what's going on yeah, and, very up to and date. keep they're doing a great job yeah so um, we're very hopeful but you know we don't believe we got it until we got it so right. we got to keep working at it don't count you chickens that's what they say yeah so what about remember the 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 whole big giant 800 pound gorilla of that is the trigger clause that makes it into just a you know, like a masturbatory kind of a legislation if, if five other contiguous states have to all be gone board and blah, blah, blah. What about trigger clause in Vermont's law? It's not in there. Oh, wow. They listen to us. Jeez. Yeah. That's that's incredible. Yeah. What about what about the big dog Monsanto and all of its, you know, not just bluster and threat to sue? What about, what about defense funds and stuff? Well, that's the reason they sent it to appropriations, mm -hmm. and they're trying to figure out the legal defense. And I don't know the details of that. Um, there was some talk about trying to allow citizens to contribute to a legal defense, but they didn't want to set a precedence so that you know big corporations could come in and do a legal defense for something we don't like. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's happening with that exactly. I don't know the you know there's there's been a lot of talk and there's, there'll probably be more talk on the Senate floor about it, but I don't know the details of that. Okay. But they're definitely they sent it to appropriations because they wanted to appropriate the money that it might cost to defend this bill. And if we lose in court, it could cost the state up to $10 million. Probably not that much, but it could cost that much. Just we don't expect that's going to happen. We, we think we're going to win the case, but it's, nothing is given. But also, I think it's going um, to get other states going, and I don't think ultimately we're going to be alone on this. The, I think we're just going to be... people in other states to dry, put politicians' asses on the fire yeah, I think we're just going to lead the way like we have before, mm -hmm. which Vermont is um, good at doing. Yeah, there is some collective courageousness in this state. I love that about this place. Yeah. Not, everybody's not a milk toast. Um, so, well, that's, that's all really good news. I, I do want to thank the activists in California, though, because mm, the California, yeah. I mean, we've been working on the GMO issue on and off for since I've been, I have been since 2000, mm -hmm. but the California ballot initiative really got people going again across the country, and mm -hmm. it got a lot of us going again. And I want to thank them for getting things going, even though they barely lost in their ballot initiative. It was really important. Yeah, to sustain the momentum to yeah, get something done. Yeah, it got done. things going again. Right. Like the issue about that we were talking about, about all these complex issues around energy and infrastructure. Um, we can no longer count on basically just somebody being a Democrat or being a liberal because a lot of their role, has, it's turned out nowadays, is to take all these controversial issues, bring them back into the crib, and smother them in, with a blanket. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's the reason we're doing this at the state level is because nationally they're totally bought out by biotech right. and, and the big corporations. I mean, the, the agriculture situation nationally is terrible. It's, it's just run by big corporations, factory farms, GMOs, and the national politicians are bought out. So yeah. that's why we're doing this on the state level. Yeah. The only thing agricultural remaining about it is they use dirt. 
I mean, everything else is just a complete, you know, just a, com you know, just a complete industrial process. I'm trying to be nice and not use too much profanity like we did last week. But <laughs> well, I think the topsoil level is going down and down and down. Oh yeah, in they're the, running in in the, the dirt too. Because they've used too many chemicals. You wouldn't want to compost anything. God forbid, that's a waste product. Actually, no, you can pack it up and sell it. <laughs> Mix it with sand. Yeah. But um, yeah, Matthew, thanks a lot for uh, for what your work too. I mean, uh, you know, you you guys, everybody in rural Vermont, and just all the other um, people involved in the state uh, really deserve some um, appreciation also. Because without activists, it doesn't it doesn't happen. So yeah, it's a it's a little ironic. I mean, VPIRG has been really good at helping yes. us on this issue, but they have yes. not been good on the wind issue. Right. Mm -hmm. But they did their summer canvas last year on the GMO issue. It was the first time they did a non-energy issue. And mm -hmm. they, re they really helped us get further along, yeah. even though they haven't helped you folks with the wind issue. But the, it's kind of ironic. Yeah. The political will comes in when enough people get in there. Like, and, and VPIRG is a valuable organization. But all of these more you know, groups and institutions, they when their butts are on the fire, and also when they feel the support from the, from the grassroots, they get a lot braver. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, thank you very much, folks, for tuning in to another, our 20th episode of Critical Mass TV. We love everybody, and we will see you again next time. Thank you all for being on. Thanks I really appreciate it. You better come back us. or I'm going to be mad. <laughs>brought you to Vermont? I, mean, I grew up in Vermont oh. and um, met my husband when he was in college. We moved back to Maryland where he's from um, for job purposes and about 16 years ago we bought a camp at Lake Eden, our dream place mm -hmm. to buy a camp. Then five years ago this farm became available. We bought it and I'm thinking this is the golden opportunity. I'm back my, where my roots are able to come back home, show my children and share with my children what it's like to grow up in rural Vermont and my grandchildren. And now, lo and behold, here's a wind project in my front yard at my farm and in my front yard at my camp. The two treasures of my life. And I am heartbroken. I'm disappointed and really disappointed in my um, fellow Vermonters. They have let me down. I grew up with these absolutely pristine mountains and ridge lines, and they are going to be forever ruined and for very little benefit, if any benefit at all. Not any benefit to you, me, and all the other Vermonters. The electric goes back out in the grid and, you know, and then my rates are going to climb. So I just feel my lifetime dream of sharing this beautiful place with my family and friends, it's gone. It's going to be gone. It's going to be destroyed. We need green energy, but this type of energy is not 100% green. We are, end up destroying absolutely pristine um, ridge lines, and the efficiency is... The, all the uh, research data just proves the efficiency is not there. Um, it's not green. You have re have to have reserve power. It's so it, it's, this is not about me and my family and my friends. It's about the whole state. It's about every ridge line that is not efficient to produce energy is not in character of the state. You look historically, we are the Green Mountain st State. We're not the Green Mountain State with windmills on every ridge line. We are the Green Mountain State. People come here for the beauty, the simplicity of this state, the down-to-earthness, the to see the person making the pottery, to see the maple syrup being made. No one is coming here to see windmills. That's not what this state is about. This, this state is about a special warmness and family traditions, and our tradition is not to destroy what Mother Nature has given to us. What about the wildlife? Oh. Hasn't Vermont protected its wildlife? We've always protected our wildlife. It is so precious. Um, we all know the plight of the eagle. 
Don't let it also become a plight of the bear, the deer, the moose, the fox, the bats, all the birds that we have. And it will happen if you allow the destruction of our beautiful mountains and have them leveled on the tops of the mountains, just completely leveled off, where you're going to destroy their natural habitat, their migration um, paths, and and when it's gone, it's gone. You can never, ever get it back. No, because in Iowa, for instance, or in Texas, they've ordered them down. But we can't then build the mountaintop back up. No, we cannot. And, you know, in, in the Midwest and in the Great Plains, it is already flat. And, like, you know, they certainly have the wind. We don't have the consistent wind here. Um, and you have to look at green power. And I... I'm 100%. We were recycling when my son was elementary school, and he's 37 now. In the third and fourth grade, they started talking about recycling. We were the first people to have recycling on our street, uh, having the bins and stuff. I said, it, we're all about green. We had solar panels at our, on our house in Maryland, and they were very efficient. Two solar panels reduced my electric bill by $50 a month. Branch of that was a number of years ago. Heated but the hot water. It heated yeah. our hot water. It didn't heat the house, but it did heat the hot water. A huge difference. Why aren't we pursuing something other than windmills for this state?